Please, you should do this at home. And you can trust me on this because I'm an expert. So, once upon a time, people drew maps. And maps allow us to represent our knowledge. Maps allow us to show well the things we know and the one we don't. What are the things we know and the one we don't. And sometimes, where we do not know enough about an area on a map, we say, here be dragons. Whatever is here is as real and as well known as a dragon to us. It's mythical. And potentially, it could be like a dragon, an area filled with dangers. Who knows what you can find in the unknown of a dragon's area? In programming, they know of such areas. Programmers warn newcomers about them. Beware of the strings. Float do not work like you think. Compilers and interpreters are complex work. They even call the reference books about compilers a dragon's book. Today's tale is about exploring one of these dragons field area. How dragons were met, how some were befriended, and how you can do it at home. Like most years of programmers, this one starts with a blog post. In October 2020, Thomas, our protagonist, discovered this brain teaser. Hello everyone. So let's say we have this piece of JavaScript code. We, it's pretty simple. We take two floats because JavaScript only have floats. We multiply them. We concatenate it with a string. And that means that we do a floating point conversion, right? A float to string conversion. The question I ask, and I will give you a few seconds to think about it is what's going to be the slowest part? Just saying, try to decide which of these four operations is the slowest part. Um, I could also consider the, you know, assignment, but that's not going to change anything here. So um, while you are thinking, let me mention that you will see my text on the, the right for you in the absence of live question, captions, so you can see, know what I'm talking about. So um, anyone has an answer? Um, the answer is a float to string conversion. And it's really, really slow. Like it's easily 400 times slower than all the other operation on this slide by Antigua. And that shocked me at the time, right? Like that, that, that is strange. So I explored how transforming a floating point to a string evolved over the years and how we ended up with this problem. And I discovered the world of dragons, and historically, we know that doing a float to string conversion has been done since a long time ago. Strings, uh, floats are not new, and you need to show them to a human, right? You need a human to be able to interpret them, to be able to translate them into whatever you are doing. That's not new. But we barely have any records of how things were done historically in that. It is really tough to be this kind of niche. It is thought that this is a kind of niche, right? Extremely specific and not that important, right? Float, we'll use floating points, translate them to strings. It's a pretty specific thing. And it's niche, it's risky, it's complex, float and string. It's a dragon area. So the first record of such a technique is from 1990. Um, and the algorithm is our first dragon. It's called Dragon 4. Um, it probably helps that Guy Steele was one of the co-authors to make the paper appeals for something that everyone ignored before that. And this got improved a bit. And um, the 1996 uh, paper, which I'm not going to try to pronounce the name of the author because I'm going to fail at that, um, is the one that is a reference for, and is going to stay as a reference for many decades. It's the one you are still going to see used in most plays. There was some exploration and the other dragon's name, the Grisu and Errol algorithm in the 2010s, but they all had slight problem and disadvantage and nothing really came out of that. Finally, in 2018, Alpha Adams from Google gave us another algorithm named for a dragon, Roo. And that's the one we're going to talk about more during this session. 
I'm going to mention tools algorithm, uh, Shoopfall and Dragon Ball Box. Um, they are area of research still today, which could make things even better, but they are not what we're going to talk about today. So, but why, right? A lot of people keep telling me, but why are you going to deal with all that stuff? And, and I wondered why, why I'm exploring all these dragons. Um, strings are well known, are well known to be problematic in nearly every language. Um, floating point numbers are well known to be a dangerous area to touch where every strange things happen. One with edge cases, like when you get both together, that's a pretty hard problem on a niche, right? Well, the problem is today, if you use a detection format based on text with a lot of floats, so think using formats like JSON, SVG, CSV, the fact that float to string is slow is a problem. And it's a problem because at this point, if you try to send things on a disk or on the network, your bottleneck is not going to be your bandwidth for your disk or your bandwidth for your network. It's going to be your CPU doing this conversion. This is as bad as it gets. It, it's hard to get it worse because your bottleneck is on your CPU and CPU are not getting faster because we'll know that. And, um, and the problem is that there are more and more use for this kind of format. Um, if you have touched Phoenix Live View, you know that people love using SVGs to do graphics with it because it's super easy to manipulate. The browser render it pretty fast. It's pretty small to be able to get great graphic in terms of, of size. But SVG use floats everywhere because it's a graphic format. Monitoring use a lot of floats. Prometheus, OpenTelemetry, a lot of the monitoring stuff that take metrics want floats for them. And they have pretty good reason for it, and maybe we'll talk a bit about that. Um, IoT tend to have the same use case for metrics, and that means that they are going to use floats too. And uh, machine learning and data science use floats everywhere. And the reality is that if you have worked in any kind of company for the service that you, at some point, you have to put a CSV with all the data in it, because Excel will accept it, and a lot of people in your company are going to use Excel. So this is useful, like it matters. We have a CPU bottleneck for something that is used a lot and more and more. So that's a problem. So let's look at what we can do. And also, why the hell is it slow? Because like, this is a floating point number, it's a string, like this is not particularly hard, right? You just take the numbers and put them. So let's, let's look a little bit. So floats are usually stored as a I IEEE 754 standard, right? The standard defined multiple size, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128 bits. I think are the one defined, but they all work the same. And they just allow you to have more and more precision or less and less. Um, and what I'm going to show you is how this work with 0 0.3 in 16 bits floats and we're going to see why that may be a big problem. So if I take 0.3, um, that's the 16-bit binary that I get from it, if I follow the IEEE 734 format. And OK, I get this binary, great. Um, now on the beam, uh, 64 bits are used, but 16 bits works exactly the same, it's just smaller. Each part is smaller, so it's easier to show on the slide. If I want to get the decimal number, the string that I want for this binary, it's relatively easy. You have a sign, an exponent, a mantissa, that's the names they have. You do this math, so you take the sign, you take one dot the mantissa in bias two, you multiply by two to the power of the exponent minus the bias because we want to handle negative stuff, not important. It's all easy math, we do it. There are a few special cases and stuff called subnormals, but they do not matter for getting into a string. And we get this number. Wait, that is not 0 0.3, but that's the exact binary. Okay, so what happened here? Well, what happened is that 0 0.3 does not exist in the IEEE floating point numbers universe because this long number we have here is the closest one to 0 0.3 that we can represent in this universe because there are infinite floats, but we have only 16 bits. So we have to take a precision hit, right? We have to represent only some floats. So how does it work? Well, basically, if we put the half point between this binary and the binary before and after on the 
whole thing, we get this two half point, and this binary represents all the numbers that are in this red line in between these two. Right? So basically, we have one binary that represents an infinite number of floats, and that gives us a precision. And it happens that indeed 0 0.3 is there near the middle. So we have indeed the closest representation to 0 0.3 that is possible with our 16 bits. So we could print this long number that will be exactly precise, right? But that's not great. First, because if I print that string to a human, they're going to hate it. That, that's just not how we think about our floating point numbers as humans. It's super hard to read, it's just hard to pass. Like you probably read a few zero on the four and then you stop thinking about it. And secondly, it's a lot of characters. Right? So if I use a string format, that's a lot of bytes. That's a lot of space taken on my disk or on my network. What we want what we want is probably the shortest possible string that would still conserve all the information about the binary that is under it. So we would not lose any information. It would be probably easier to read because it would be shortest. In this case, it's the other three, so it would be really short and easy to read. And it will take really few bytes. Easy converge, easy compression. That would be nice. This, as a rule, we want. So um, we want information, we want the same information, we want the minimum length, and we want correct rounding, which is harder than it seems. Um, and the name of an algorithm that respects this rule is known as the shortest round trip float to string conversion. Because the idea is that you if you give it 0 three is going to give you the binary, and if you get the binary, you're going to get 0 0.3 and you can keep doing it. It just works. And it's the shortest. Okay. So this is what we want to do. Now, um, what are the way we can get a string for float in Erlang? Well, there is mostly two ways. Uh, there is a there is BIFs, float to list and float to binary. They do not do shortest. We cannot get that. We cannot only get a scientific fo format and a fixed point form and fixed precision format, which represents the percent %f and percent %i that you may know from printf on C standards. This uses basically directly libc the libc printf, and the, the OTP team is not particularly interested in changing that. It works, and it's code that we know working that we don't support. Um, and I doubt we'll see progress on the speed of that here because the libcs are really, really slow to change. Um, the estimation from people working on this kind of problem is that maybe in a couple of decades we may see them changing the algorithm to faster one, maybe, uh, but not sure. The other advantage, the other solution is called IOLIP format FYG. And this one is a total implementation of the 96 algorithm we talked before in Erlang in the standard library. It's a private API, so technically, maybe people should not use it. It happens that everyone use it. Uh, JSON, Poison, uh, Elixir, standard library itself, everyone use it. So the good news is that if we change this one, which is relatively easy, just say Erlang code, we can, and we already maintain it, we can get a better float to string solution. That's great. Um, and that's what happened. Uh, the pull request 20, 2960 that you can find on GitHub, funded by the Allen Foundation, is what we did. We implemented Brew to replace the historical uh, 96 version. And spoiler, it's really faster. How much? Well, we got approximately a 5x speed up. Even without the JIT, we get a 4x speed up, which is pretty nice for something where we just change the algorithm and keep it in the language. No performance optimization, we just change the algorithm to the Roo new one. That's pretty nice. Um, now, how did we do that? Well, we want to go fast, right? Well, it seems that, it, indeed, if you remember all that, this was what the Beam was using, like everyone does in programming. Every libc, every standard library of every language use a 96 version of Dragonfall. What we implemented, what I implemented is Roo, which is works as well and is far, far faster. And the reason why it's faster is mostly because um, one of the way Dragonfall works and most implementation of this problem works is that they need begins. 
they need integers that are infinitely large, possibly. But true can limit everything to 64-bit integers due to the way it works. And that enables a lot of work because your CPUs knows how to do all that and you don't have to do all kind of complex mathematics to be able to have really large integers and complex memory handling. The good news is we can go even faster. Um, we will use the Ru C implementation, which is a reference implementation by Alpha Adams, in the BIF. Remember, we have the float to library and binary BIFs. We can use the Ru C implementation directly there. We just are going to add a new option. Well, we'll not replace the existing one, but we'll add a new option. Because float to list two, with an array of two, take an option. So we can take that. Um, this is a pull request in progress. Um, I still have some problem with a link on Windows, but for the few benchmark I've been doing on this really rough pull request, we're already four times faster than the previous version, which means that we are now at a 20x speed up compared to before, which means that the CPU is not the bottleneck anymore. Uh, hopefully we will see that in TP24.1, but maybe later, we'll see. Um, if we change what the default is, probably will be 25 because that would potentially break things. This is PR 47A19 for people of you that want to go to GitHub immediately. And this is also funded by the Allen Foundation. And I am really, really thankful to them to help us all get there. So look for it, look for the pretty option when it come out and enjoy faster fluid to print conversion. Um, now, another question is, could we go even faster than that? And Yes, possibly. Uh, Dragonbox is interesting work here, but that would need to replace the use of Sprintf in Erlang and in OTP, and that means maintenance work because that's C code that we now that the OTP team own now and not the libc team, and that means constant work on it to make sure it keeps working. Or we need to change what the libc use, but I don't know if you have tried. It's not great to try to upstream stuff into the libcs. So, um, so that's where we are now. We would need to, even if we want to go even faster, we need to replace printf, or we want to use a faster algorithm maybe, but that's the same problem. So maybe we will just look at doing it the other way around. Speeding up string to float conversion for decoding is also interesting and could probably be far faster than it is right now. Now, what to get from this, right? There are a lot of niche dragon array in the beam and and they are totally, this is totally something you can go in and help. Timer just have a super nice pull request making them far better recently. Someone just did that because they wanted to change a small thing and decided to refactor the whole thing because they were thinking it was better. Um, there is a lot of part of the beam that could, that could use help. The shell, the SSH library, the DNS library. There's a lot of stuff here that could work really well. And you know what? There is no specialist out there on these particular areas. But you can become one, right? Anyone here. I knew nothing about this problem until six months ago when I discovered that Brent teaser and decided to explore. I am now probably one of the few persons in the world that is interested by this problem and can tell you why it's problematic and how to make it faster. Um, and that's the thing, right? People are usually helpful. And usually this is not too hard. Like that looks like a super niche thing with a lot of dragons. And you know what? And you what? I was able to get straight without knowing anything and being able to get the PR and help everyone. So help the community and get into it. Let's make the beam better for everyone. Now I want to add a little thing here. Um, we need funding to help these things, right? The Alan Foundation was able to help me, and that's great. But it's hard to get funding for this kind of things. The Alan Foundation has a limited budget, so. Please, if you want to see the beam get better for everyone, consider, you know, helping the Allen Foundation by your in, in, by contributing time, or just talk to your company on maybe sponsoring and helping the Allen ecosystem doing these kind of things. Because the reality is that until our fans in 2018 we discovered this algorithm doing something that has nothing to do with this job, no one has been able to make things faster since 96. Everyone paid the price for this lack of work since 96 in every ecosystem in the planet. So remember, 
Dragons are fun and friendly, and that's how you get things working. I found a lot of great ones, and I'm now going to use the term Rue far more. And please, do this at home. You can trust me, I'm an expert on this now. And we need people exploring how to make the beam better for everyone. So benchmark your stuff on ETP24 to see if that helps you, but maybe it will just be the JIT. And come help, let's make the beam better for everyone. I am Thomas de Pierre. Thomas de Pierre, if you pronounce this better, because accents are a thing. And that was my talk. Excellent. Um, yeah, we already have a question in the Q&A. Have you measured the impact of this optimization in an existing complex application from, from Peter Nosek? Uh, one sec. I'm just, yeah. So yeah, um, so I, I did try, so in an existing complex application, not really, because that's complicated, right? You need to build the beam and you need all kind of stuff. But um, we do have some results. Um, I did test the BIF with a benchmark for JSON, which is a, a JSON library for Elixir. And uh, we do get the, the benchmarks that use a lot of flow do get the full time speed up. So that was indeed the bottleneck in there. Now, knowing the exact, um, the exact impact um, is going to be hard, right? Knowing the exact impact is going to be hard. Uh, because not a lot of application do only that, right? Um, but we know that in all the uh, area where people implemented this exactly, um, for example, there are a couple of databases that implemented it to get better flow to strength for the result. Um, they, like, the ClickHouse come to mind, they implemented this, and um, a whole query, like just doing a query, got a 5% speed up because it ended up that one of the main bottleneck of just doing a query was to send back the result as a string because there was floating point in there. So, so there is real impact um, in, in that we know. Uh, so far, no further questions, but um, if, if anybody wants to ask a question, you also can unmute yourself and, and just ask the question. And if there is some question also on how or more details of this works, I have a few bonus slides if you want to have a look at it. So until somebody, oh, there's another one. Um, from Tia Leek, could the need for the conversion be avoided in some cases by storing the floating value as a rational? And would that be practical to in implement in OP, OTP, I assume? I mean, so yeah, I mean, that's, um, I mean, not really. Um, there are, are, are moments where you want your math to be done on a fractional, right? In this case, you have multiple libraries that do it. And doing it OTP would possibly be a possibility, like it would be an extension of the language that would do a lot of thinking, which I'm not part of the OTP team. But um, usually when you do a, when you do a translation to a string, right? when you encode your float to a string, that means that you are seeing it outside Right? You, are, you are not limited into your boundaries. If I send it to, for example, uh, an SVG to do a graphic on the web, I, I can't put a rational in there. That's simply not a load, right? So, and so in, in theory, and I am not sure that doing a translation from a rational to a floating point string would be far faster because you end up with the same kind of problems because now you need to take into account which precision you want and how you round. So, and this is going to be considered as a floating point number of, you know, the nitride Tripoli 734 on the other side, right? Because that's how it's defined. So that, that would, maybe in some case, that would be a lot of research to make sure of that, I would say. Okay, let me check. Do we have another question? Um, I, I have a, a remark and some question. Um, First, a remark, um, kind of like getting funding is hard. That's true. Um, Erlang Foundation can always get more sponsors and more funding. But I also wanted to get the message out. We are not, we still have, we still have money in the box. And if you want any project funded, um, this is, this is by, by all means possible. And for example, come to me, or there's also a form on the website. And if you have an interesting project um, that, at best uh, benefits the whole community 
get it funded because actually spending the money makes it easier for us to ask for more money from companies because then we can say, yeah, we did this and this and this. So that's this thing. Um, another question, I think we have a little bit more time. Um, um, how about the, the, the scanning float thing, like the reading floats from strings? Yes. Uh, um, what is there also a kind of like a magic algorithm like real or? Not as well. Um, th there are multiple research and there's a few things happening in this area, but it's, so you, you have to keep in mind that both areas are really niche and had nearly no evolution for decades. Uh, so it's pretty new that Rue and the Dragon Box things happened. Um, now, th there have been some research by the same people trying to basically apply the reverse algorithm to it, and it has shown some improvement, but nowhere as fast. Um, but the prime is also a bit less complicated in a way. Um, there have been, there mm. is a, a real, and I have a tab open somewhere. Uh, there has been a, a big thing that people talk about a lot here, which um, is not an algorithm, but a list of tricks that some people have tried to use to get really fast um, decoding of a string to a float. The problem is that um, this list of tricks are really fast, but works only in a, not in every case. So it works in 95% of the case. And the 5% that are left, you have to go back to the old version, to the old algorithm. And that's great. It gives you a really great speed up usually, but it also means that you can't really know what kind of speed up you're going to get, get you, right? It's really hard to benchmark and to understand. And it also means that you have to maintain the two version, right? You are now the fast, the fast pass and the slow pass, and you are now two algorithms to maintain in terms of code. And the reality is that right now the OTP team has a limited amount of resources, and maintaining this kind of thing is probably not going to be something you can do. So this kind of pull request will probably be refused. So is there a way to get speed up? Yes. As great, not yet. And I don't know if we could, but um, that's an open area for research. So we just wait for the research. There was a question for, is there a pull request? I mean, you had a few links up quickly. Yep. Maybe you can post it um, after yes. the talk in the chat. I will. Yes, um, I will post. Uh, one, the, one, one, yeah. one of the pull requests is already posted. The other one is okay. um, is, is still missing. Yes, there is. Um, so the, the, the two pull requests are there. Um, I, I will. The slide are available. I mean, okay. I did not left the slide up, but there was a link on every slide where they are available. But I will. Um, I will give the link uh, in the Hoover, in the Hoover, uh, chat. Um, the, the thing to keep in mind is that uh, the first pull request is out and it's part of OTP24. So you should already see a speed up in your JSON stuff. Uh, the second one, it's C. So it keeps failing on all kinds of things that have nothing to do with the code. So uh, it's still a, a work in progress. I hope to have it for OTP24.1, but it may happen that we push it to 25 because we may make this the default way to do strings, which would I mean, I don't think we promise there is any promise on the from the OTP team on the formatting of the strings from the float to list and float to binary, except that it's correct from the IEEE 744 specification. But we'll probably push it to OTP25 because it would be a breaking change in a way for some people, probably if they depend on that formatting really specifically. Excellent. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, for a language that's that's actually running on a on a VM, this is kind of like all these improvements that we're recently getting, like performance improvement, uh, are really excellent because they affect all of our code, all of our code. So now we got the chit, floating points got faster. Yeah. Do you have any other areas? Where would be pretty, because you probably looked at performance areas maybe during your work. Did, is yeah. there any other low hanging fruit so, or so not medium we... medium height? <laughs> Yeah, there is nothing that come directly to mind, but I'm not the specialist in there. Um, there is a lot of things where we know right now that there's a lot of things that are not optimal, right? Like, for example, the the float to string stuff I'm doing is going to be really fast for the shortest if you use a pretty option. All the other ones that we have algorithms to speed up are not going to be speed up anytime soon because that would mean maintaining this code instead of using sprintf, which no one wants to do. Um, 
there are probably a lot of areas like that. Nothing come to mind immediately because that's not the kind of thing I've researched particularly, but there is a lot of places where we know code have not been touched in a decade or two, even in the beam, right? Um, there is a lot of things like we have um, two different ways to get a shell in the beam. And one of them is there just because one of the applications have never been moved to the new one. We could probably get rid of that dead code if someone sit down and did the work of porting, which is probably not that hard, just need to be done. And um, a lot of things like that, right? So it's, I mean, we, and it does not have to be complex, right? But it's all these things that do not get done because, well, it's not urgent for anyone. It's not the thing, it just works kind of. So there is a lot of areas we can look at and it doesn't have to be performance. Right? It can also be all kinds of little things. Um, I was talking yesterday during the speakers meetup with um, people from the TV team and people from other places about the fact that everyone keeps saying that the no local return message from Dionyzer is really painful. No one has sit down to change it since the moment Dionyzer was committed to OTP, right? So that's the kind of thing someone could just spend the time to understand what message to put, put it and that would make the life of everyone better. Uh, so there are a lot of areas like that. The question is if you don't if you don't need AI to actually understand dialyzer messages and explain them. That's a different problem. But that, but I mean, I knew nothing about float to string. And if I come to someone tomorrow yeah. and tell them you need to understand how string works, how floats works, and how to translate from one to another, they would probably tell you it's not possible either. So you know, it's spending a lot a, a bit of time into that probably will get a lot of results. Definitely. Any other questions? There is a small thing, though. Yeah. Um, I know, but I don't know. It will not be perfect for everyone, but um, common test does not run, uh, can only group, run groups of tests in parallel, but not application tests in parallel. It has to linearize the applications. There is no reason it has to do that. It should just be able to do. So it just somewhere in the code, something doesn't let it do in parallel. So if someone wants to go find that, feel free, as your TB team would probably gladly accept it, and just that it's not urgent enough to speed that bit of code of testing that no one has done it. Well, when you're done with your floating point stuff, you're free. <laughs> That's on the list. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I have other things <laughs> also, but yeah, it is. Yeah. So more questions from the audience? And also unmute yourself and just say something. Yeah, I found it very, very interesting. It's sort of a very low level uh, research into something. It's very clever stuff, quite well done. Thank you for the talk. Yeah, no problem. I mean, it's it's interesting. Um, the reason Alf Adams ended up working on that is that his day-to-day -day work has nothing to do with that. He work on Bazel, which is a build system for Google. And uh, he was working on his own um, Java virtual machine for fun, right? It's a, just his home Java virtual machine he's writing for fun on his free time. And he ended up with, okay, how do I do this? How do I show in my shell the floats when I'm minted added floats, right? I need to do a, a string conversion because it's a shell. And and he stumbled over the fact that it was super slow and was like, I'm not going to let it be slow. And he found, and he spent a few months on years finding a way to make it fast. And that's how we got through. And so that's, that's, he did a lot of the clever work on all. Um, I mostly just try to translate the C implementation he has into something that works well for Erlang. I mean, I will be in Toucan anyway, if more people have questions that come to their mind. <clears throat> I, think so. I, I, I actually have a request because since we have a whole room full of people interested in floating points, <laughs> would anyone be interested in having complex numbers as a data type in OTP in the Erlang runtime? If yes, talk to me during the conference, please. <laughs> um, something I would ask at the same time, if people mention decimals, if people want fixed point, fixed precision numbers, please talk to us too. Um, or me, um, I don't think that would be easy to add to OTP as it is right now. That would be a lot of work, but um, it's an interesting area where nearly no uh, programming language out there 
do it natively well for the past 30 decades. Um, that, that's one of the reasons why banks think on COBOL. So um, that would be probably interesting for Erlang to begin to tackle those kind of things. It would probably not be easy, and I don't even know how usable it would be, but that's probably an interesting thing if people are interested. Okay, uh, I think we came to the end of the slot. I, I'll, I'll give you some time to switch to the next uh, track then. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you. Keep everyone. up the good work. Thank you.